So in this last lecture, we shall look at radial fo uh, functions and Fourier transform of radial functions. We shall specifically look at the n equal to 2 and n equal to 3, the 2 and 3 dimensional cases. So first let us define the Fourier transform of a function of several variables. You got a function f of x1, x2, xn of several variables. Assume that it's rapidly decreasing. The Fourier transform f hat of chi1, chi2, chi n is by definition integral over rn <coughs> x of minus i x1 chi1 plus da 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 plus xn chi n f of x1 x2 xn dx1 dx2 dxn and we are going to assume that the integrals make sense that the function is rapidly decreasing so that i can differentiate under the integral sign and so on and so forth now we're going to make the assumption that f is a radial function now what is a radial function a function is said to be radial if it de depends only on the distance of the point x1 x2 xn from the origin namely f of x1 x2 xn is a function of square root of x1 square plus dot 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 plus xn square then we shall see that the fourier transform also has the same property namely f hat of chi1 chi2 chi n is a function which depends only on square root of chi1 square plus dot 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 plus chi n square now to understand this let us write this expression x1 chi1 plus x2 chi2 plus dot 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 plus xn chi n as a dot product of xn chi x has been bold faced indicating that it's a vector it's difficult to get a bold face on the chi so unfortunately the sky has not been bold face but if you think of the chi as a vector so x dot chi the triangular bracket refers to the dot product in rn x1 chi1 plus x2 chi2 plus dot 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 plus xn chi n so now what happens is that let us choose a rotation matrix a <clears throat> a matrix of rotation which represents the rotation of uh, coordinate system fixing the origin in such a way that a of en equal to chi upon norm chi now chi upon norm chi is a unit vector and en en is a standard unit vector 0 comma 0 comma 0 da, 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 last coordinate is 1 all coordinates except the last one are 0 and the last coordinate is the standard unit vector <clears throat> the last of the standard unit vectors and I want to show that there is a rotation matrix. We can we can choose the rotation matrix A such that A, A of En equal to chi upon norm chi. We shall see later how to choose such an A. Why should such an A exist? But let us make such a let us make such a choice. Then chi, <clears throat> then what we can do is chi can be written as A norm chi times En. So we write, so the expression becomes, the definition of Fourier transform becomes f hat of chi1 chi2 chi n equal to integral over rn x of minus i and the dot product of x and chi, but chi is norm chi a e n. Norm chi is a scalar, so it comes out of a, the dot product and it have simply a e n dot product with x f of x1 x2 xn dx1 dx2 dxn now what is the dot product of a e n comma x it is simply e n dot product with a transpose x remember that a is an orthogonal matrix so a transpose is also an orthogonal matrix in fact a a transpose equal to a transpose a equal to i now I'm going to make a change of variables. I'm going to put a transpose x. So excuse me. Now I'm going to put x equal to a y. I'm going to put x equal to a y. So that what happens is that <clears throat> a transpose of x becomes y because a transpose is the same as a inverse. And the determinant of a is 1. I'm going to assume that it's a rotation matrix with determinant 1. So what is dx1, dx2, dxn? dx1, dx2, dxn is J the Jacobian times dy1, dy2, dy. But what is the Jacobian? Jacobian is simply the determinant of A. Well, A is a linear transformation. So and the determinant of A is 1. So dx1, dx2, dxn simply becomes dy1, dy2, dyn. And the, what happens to the integral? <coughs> the integral becomes aen dot with x is the same as en dot with a transpose of x and a transpose of x is y so en dot with y is simply y n so it is e to the power minus i times norm chi y n into f of a y 
into dy1 dy2 dy1 but remember that f is rotation invariant so f of x equal to f of ay which is the same as f of y the function depends only on the <coughs> the function f depends only on root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared and square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared is the same as the square root of y1 squared plus y2 squared plus yn squared because a is a rotation matrix <coughs> when you rotate the distance from the origin doesn't change it, it is invariant so what happens to the integral the integral simply becomes e to the power minus i norm chi y n f of y1 y2 y n but f of y1 y2 y n will depend only on the square root of y1 square plus y2 square plus y n square dy1 dy2 dy n now let us do it for n equal to 2 and n equal to 3 let us compute this integral or simplify this integral for n equal to 3 first and then we'll do n equal to 2 so since f depends only on the radial a radial distance of from the origin let us write little f of x1 x2 xn equal to capital f of r where r is square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus dot 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 plus xn squared so for n equal to 3 let us use polar coordinates what are polar coordinates cos theta sine phi sine theta sine phi cos phi multiplied with r so the first coordinate is r cos theta sine phi the second coordinate is r Co co sin theta sin phi third coordinate is r cos phi third coordinate is r cos phi so here instead of y3 i'm going to have e to the power minus ir norm chi cos phi and then <clears throat> f of course depends only on the radial coordinate so it's capital f of r what is dy1 dy2 dy3 if you have done calculations in your calculus courses multivariable calculus courses or three-dimensional calculus calculus of three dimensions three variables you will know that dy1 dy2 dy3 is r squared sine phi dr d theta d phi now the phi variable goes from 0 to pi and the theta variable goes from 0 to 2 pi this is the standard thing about spherical polar coordinates in three dimensions so now we got this so now we got this integral but the r integral r runs from 0 to infinity and so this integral is done last and the theta nothing depends on theta so integral 0 to 2 pi d theta that is simply 2 pi so the two so that so the fourier transform is f hat of chi 1 chi 2 chi 3 equal to 2 pi times integral from 0 to infinity capital f of r r squared dr now i'm going to put cos phi equal to s remember phi goes from 0 to pi minus sine phi d phi equal to ds and when phi equal to 0 s is 1 and when phi equal to pi s is minus 1 so the integral goes from minus 1 to 1 e to the power minus i r s norm chi ds and i can immediately calculate this there's a cosine term and there's a sine term the sine term uh, and then there's going to be and you're going to compute the integral <clears throat> and the sine integral of the sine term will be zero and the integral of the cosine term will simply give you sine norm chi r dr so we have because when you integrate a one upon there will be a one upon r coming in the denominator that will cancel with this r squared so only one r is left over and so the fourier transform is four pi upon norm chi integral zero to infinity f of r into r sin r norm chi dr so it's a elementary sine transform the three dimensional integral for fourier transform has simply become a one dimensional integral namely a, a, a sine transform so now let us take the case n equal to 2 which is more interesting so when n equal to 2 what happens is that your y1 equal to r cos theta y2 equal to r sine theta now what do we have here remember that we have only e to the power minus i norm chi y2 and y2 will be r sine theta and f of course will be capital f of r but dy1 dy2 what is a spherical what are the what is the polar coordinates in r2 y1 equal to r cos theta y2 equal to r sin theta dy1 dy2 equal to r dr d theta correct you got r dr d theta so what do we get 
So the R is there, one R is left over, R times capital F of R dr, R runs from 0 to infinity, the theta goes from minus pi to pi or 0 to 2 pi, it's your, take your pick, cos of R norm chi sin theta d theta. Unfortunately, this integral will not simplify. There we had in the, in the three dimensional polar coordinates, we had that sin phi d phi and cos of R norm chi into, uh, we, got, we, we, got, we got that we had the cos phi under the exponential. So we could have made a change of variables. We could put cos phi equal to s and we could have integrated and we could have simplified the integral. Unfortunately, that is not possible. The inner integral cannot be computed in elementary terms. The inner integral turns out to be the Bessel's function of order 0. So this integral from minus pi to pi, integral from minus pi to pi cos r norm chi sin theta d theta is basically 2 pi times the j0. j0 is the Bessel's function of order 0. For those who may not be familiar with the Bessel's function, I urge you to look at the earlier part of these notes on series solutions of differential equations. The complete details about the Bessel's function of order 0 is given to you in these uh, slides. And so you can profitably consult it and you can read it. So more generally, so you see that in an n equal to 2, the Fourier transform is again radial, but it is no longer an elementary transform, like a sign transform. In three dimension, it's a sign transform. In two dimension, it is J0. Again, if you look at the five dimensions and four dimensions, and if you do this for four dimensions, you'll get J1, and for three dimensions, you'll be an elementary trigonometric transform. So in even space dimensions, the Fourier transform of a radial function reduces to a Bessel transform and in odd dimensions it is a sine transform. So that is a, the Fourier transform of a radial function is again another radial function. So I think we have completely established that property of the Fourier transform. Now in the next part I'm going to leave it out for, for now and I'm going to go to the uh, Aries functions. So Aries, George Biddle Aries. It is Sir George Biddle Airy. He was an astronomer in England in Greenwich Observatory and he has contributed significantly to various parts of physics and Airy studied the function that bears his name in the course of his investigation on the intensity of the light in the neighborhood of a caustic. For details on this you can see Watson's treatise on the theory of Bessel's functions. Watson wrote a very long book, very thick book on treatise on the theory of Bessel's function. The work of Airy goes back to 1838. Before commencing on the discussion of Airy's function, here is a very interesting pointer to the life of George Biddle Airy. Uh, I've given you the URL address of that. Another interesting account that I read long ago was by Patrick Moore. I'm not able to locate the exact document. But I think it is about the discovery of Neptune, the planet Neptune. I think uh, Pat uh, Patrick Moore wrote a book called The Planet Neptune. In that, he has given a very detailed commentary on the life of G uh, George Biddle Airy. And you might want to read that. So what is Airy's equation that we are looking at? Airy's equation is a second order differential equation, y double prime minus one third xy equal to zero. Now you might try to integrate this differential equation, but you are not going to succeed. What you could do is that you could try to find, what you could do is that you could try to write the uh, power series solution. You're going to get two linearly independent solutions and you're going to get two power series solutions. So now let us try something else. Let us try to apply the techniques of Fourier analysis. Let us try to take the Fourier transform of this equation. What happens when you take the Fourier transform of this equation? Fourier transform of y double prime equal to is what? Minus chi squared times y hat. If you do the hat of this, the hat of y double prime is minus chi squared y hat. What is the Fourier transform of xy? It's going to be 1 upon i dd chi of y hat. So what happens? The remarkable thing happens. Second order ODE becomes a first order ODE and the first order linear ODE. The first order linear ODE. Of course, there'll be a sign change, but that's okay. So, so it'll be chi squared, and there's an i coming here. So, three i chi squared y hat, and so its integrating factor is e to the power chi cube. So, you're going to get 
So you can immediately integrate the first order OD. Everybody knows how to solve a linear first order OD right from the time when you're in 12th, even a 12th standard student knows that. So you can calculate y hat. There will be, of course be an arbitrary multiplicative constant, but you can take that constant to be one because it's a linear differential equation. If y is a solution, then any constant time y is also a solution. And so y hat has been obtained in terms of in, uh, some in, uh, in terms of e to the power i chi cube by th uh, i chi cube. So you have to take the inverse for Fourier transform. You have to obtain the original function y by appealing to the Fourier inversion theorem. So right. So get y hat by integrating y hat. Uh, get y of x by integrating y hat of chi e to the power i x chi. Remember the Fourier inversion theorem? You do that. Oops. Excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, I pressed the wrong button. It has gone back. Yeah. You do that and you're going to get this y. y of x is 1 upon 2 pi. The 1 upon 2 chi, pi, uh, 1 upon 2 pi comes from the inversion theorem. Minus infinity to infinity e to the power i chi cube plus i x chi. Now that, that's uh, now the as you expected this uh, it's an odd function so the sine term will disappear the cosine term will will remain. So we got this nice integral representation there is one small problem with this integral representation. The integral converges conditionally first of all. Secondly we assumed that this Aries equation has a solution which, uh, uh, which admits a Fourier transform. There's no reason why the two power, if you try to solve it in power series, you'll get two solutions. There's no reason why those two solutions must be nice enough on the real line so that they can compute the Fourier transform. There is no reason why the Fourier transform should exist. So we assume that the Fourier transform exists and we have obtained the solution. And we even appeal to the inversion theorem. So there's a lot of, we have made lots of assumptions and it's not very clear that this integral does indeed give you a valid solution. Now what would be your next objective? Your next objective will be to try to check directly now that you somehow you obtained this formula but you are not sure whether how you arrived, arrived at this formula may not be legal but nevertheless you have arrived at a formula but you, to, you can directly check that this satisfies the differential equation. So maybe you want to compute i double prime. Maybe you want to take the derivative inside the integral. Oh, take the derivative inside the integral, differentiate this cosine two times. What are you going to get? It's going to be cos, it's going to pick up a minus sign. Cosine chi cube plus x chi and there's a chi square factor which will come out. Now that's even worse. Now it is not even clear whether the integral converges even. So there's a lot of problems by this uh, when you try to solve uh, with this formula. Nevertheless, our first objective is to show that this integral actually converges. Now, before you taking up the convergence of this integral, let us take a simpler thing. It's a cosine of a cubic. Instead of that, why don't you take the cosine of a quadratic? Why don't you look at cos of chi squared d chi? Integral from minus infinity to infinity or integral from 0 to infinity cos x squared dx or integral from 0 to infinity cos chi squared d chi. How do you check that that converges? Well, you will go from say 0 to uh, it's in, 0 to 1 is a finite integral, there is not a problem. So go from 1 to infinity. How do you integrate from 1 to infinity? You have to integrate from 1 to r, you have to integrate cos x squared from say 1 to r and then take the limit as r goes to infinity, right? So there is one very simple trick, put x squared equal to u right x squared equal to u or x equal to root u so dx equal to du by 2 root u so the integral becomes integral cos u du upon 2 root u the 2 of course is an innocent constant i'm going to ignore it because i want to i'm only interested in whether the integral converges or not now integrate by parts cos u by root u du, right? Cos u is derivative of sin u. Then integrate by parts, the derivative will shift from the cosine, from the sine to the other factor. You are going to get sin u by u to the power 3 by 2. 
So you picked up a u to the power 3 by 2 in the denominator and now that helps and now you can see that the integral converges. So one integration by parts. You should try the same idea here. You should try to put chi cube plus x chi equal to u. Of course this integral will, this substitution will only make sense for large values of chi. How large? First of all, it's enough to look at 0 to infinity because, and then in, look at minus infinity to 0 separately. So look at 0 to infinity. And then look at this, make, and then from 0 to, 0 to 1, 0 to 2, or 0 to 100, whatever you want, some finite integral, there's no problem. So you can go from some c to infinity, where c is any sufficiently large number that you can take. So you want to make the substitution chi cube plus x chi equal to u. <coughs> <coughs> then you will be able to write down, then you will be able to, re re then you will realize that exactly what happens for cos chi squared d chi, the same thing will happen, except that the calculations are slightly more complicated. Integration by parts will pick up a high power in the denominator and the integral will converge. So this integral certainly converges and it's a well-defined function of x. Problem is, I still cannot differentiate the integral under, uh, differentiate under the integral sign because that causes a chi squared to appear in front of the cosine and I'll have to justify the differenti differentiation under the integral sign. So this approach is going to be very problematic. All that we have checked is that this integral makes perfect sense. Now, to cope with the problem, what we need to do is to use Cauchy integral formula from basic complex analysis. I'm sure all of you have studied elementary complex analysis and you know that you, you know that if you have a function which is holomorphic, which is complex differentiable inside a domain, take a convex domain. If omega is a convex domain, such as the complex plane is a convex domain, right? And you have a closed contour and, and if you have a uh, complex differentiable function fz, integral fz dz over any closed contour is zero. A domain is convex, I mind you. The domain is not convex, then what I'm saying is not correct. What is the example? Take one upon z. One upon z is complex differentiable on c minus the origin. When I remove the origin from the complex domain, it is not convex. And then you take the circle, mod z equal to 1. Integral dz by z over the, over the unit circle is 2 pi i or minus 2 pi i depending upon whether you are tracing it counterclockwise or whether you are tracing it clockwise. So it's non-zero. But what is a basic hypothesis? If your domain is a convex domain, then integral of f of fz dz over every closed curve is zero. Now, how to use this wonderful thing to cope with this problem of uh, ix, how to understand this ix better. So to compute this integral, or rather to understand this integral, we do the following. We look, in, we, instead of cos of chi cube plus x chi, we make it, we complexify this chi variable, make it z. So now look at this expression, replace chi by z, which is chi plus i eta. So what is the integral that we are considering? i of x equal to 1 upon 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity e to the power i z cube plus i x z dz. What exactly is it? Eta is getting fixed. Eta is fixed and I'm thinking of this dz equal to d chi. dz equal to d chi. And I'm thinking of this as a line integral stretched over a horizontal line because eta is fixed in the complex plane. When eta equal to zero, we get the original, we get the original ix. Now the eta may not be zero, eta may be positive. So the integral now is along a line parallel to the real axis. Now what happens is that now you expand this, right, z cube, chi cube minus i cube, minus i cube eta cube. Okay. And then you have, and it comes with the i, it comes with the i factor. So what happens is that you have picked up, you, you, you will realize that because of this, because of this 
chi plus i eta this integral will now converge absolutely and very rapidly the real part of this the, the real part of this is going to be the integral that you want the real part of this is the integral that you want and the e to the power i times z cube plus x z x is fixed x is fixed so you have to compute z, you have to compute chi q chi plus i e i eta the whole q you are going to get the first term is going to be chi q but there's a i present there correct so it's going to be bounded for the second term when you expand it 3 chi squared i eta right 3 chi squared i eta and there's an i present here so what's going to happen minus 3 chi squared eta in other words you're going to get e to the power so what is the integral e to the power minus 3 chi squared eta and remember eta is positive i'm taking the horizontal line in the upper half plane so now thanks to this e to the power minus 3 chi squared eta this integral is going to converge very rapidly and absolutely so differentiating under the integrals is permissible i can differentiate i can I can take the derivative under the integral sign. Let us differentiate under the integral sign. I double prime of x is going to be x of i z cube plus i x into minus in, into minus z squared. I am going to get from differentiating this. And so you can direct by differentiating under the integral. You can check that this i of x satisfies the ODE. But now you will object, you will say that this integral i with the chi non non with the chi non-zero and positive could be different from this the, this integral, this i of x over here. How do you know that that is the same as this i of x? That is where the complex analysis comes into the picture. What you do is that this is this is an integral over the line parallel to the real axis this is an integral the same integral with eta equal to 0 so to prove that this integral and this integral are one and the same what you do is that <clears throat> what you should do is the following take a rectangle minus r r on the real axis r plus i eta minus r plus i eta. The rectangle has base along from minus r to r and the rectangle has height eta. And r is the and from it the rectangle stretches from minus r to r. So the rectangle is a closed contour in the complex plane. And what function are you integrating? X is fixed remember x is a fixed real number z e to the power i z cube plus i x z that's a complex differentiable function or you would like to call it a holomorphic function in the entire complex plane and the entire complex plane is a convex domain and so the integral over this rectangle is going to be zero so the integral from minus r to r the the bottom the base of the rectangle plus the integral along the small vertical side from r to r plus i eta and then the integral along from r plus i eta to minus r plus i eta and then the fourth or the left vertical side of the rectangle. So you have to check that as r tends to infinity the contribution from these two vertical sides go to zero and so integral along the base plus integral along the top will be zero but the top is traversed from right to left the bottom is traversed from left to right so you will see that the integral from, from uh, on the, uh, along the real axis namely this integral is exactly equal to the integral along the line parallel to the real axis in the upper half plane so the fact that these two integrals <coughs> are equal has now been established using cauchy's theorem and so and to check that this satisfies the differential equation use this avatar of the, dif uh, of, of the function and you can check that it satisfies. So this what we have obtained certainly satisfies the 
differential equation. That's not a problem. So we have solved the uh, thing. So now <clears throat> we may ask, what is the advantage of doing this? Why why not just work with a power series? After all, in elementary mathematics, we can always use a power series solution to solve the Aries equation. There are a couple of reasons. There are many reasons why the power series uh, why the why why the power series method the power series method has its own advantages. The main advantage of the power series is that it is an is an algebraic object. You can differentiate a power series term by term. You can multiply two power series as long as you are within the radius of convergence. And the power series solution for this will be will have infinite radius of convergence. So there is not a problem. And the power series can be added, power series can be multiplied, <coughs> power series can be differentiated term by term. So power series can be treated as if they are the slightly exotic cousins of polynomials and so they are amenable to algebraic manipulations. But what you would like to know is what is the behavior of the solution as x goes to infinity? What is the behavior as x goes to minus infinity? Are there infinitely many zeros? Those things are going to be very difficult to gain. Those That kind of information will be very difficult to get from the knowledge of power series. Whereas integral representations of this kind or even better than or even better integrals of this kind are amenable to estimates. You can use these integral representations to get very precise information about the behavior of the solution of the differential equation for large x. <coughs> now <coughs> we have we have made an assumption that this differential equation <coughs> has a solution. Excuse me. Take a I'll take a pause please. <coughs> we have assumed that this differential equation has a solution which is amenable to Fourier transform. In fact, the solution will, will have nice gr uh, uh, decay, uh, growth properties or decay properties. So that, that so the solution direct, uh, the, the Fourier transform exists. But this is a second order differential equation. It has two solutions, which are linearly independent. But which will uh, will it be the case that both the solutions are Fourier transformable? Both the solutions will have a valid Fourier transform. If not, which one is it that we are getting? <clears throat> Answer is no. This differential equation has only one one solution, which will be which will have Fourier transform. The other other solution will not be Fourier transformable. You can use the abel Liouville formula from your elementary ODE scores to check that if you are interested. But at the moment, if you are if you are not familiar with that, leave it aside. So the bottom line is that Fourier transform techniques have given you integral representations of solutions of differential equations, which was not going to be opt uh, obtainable by other elementary methods. These integral representations have advantages over the power series method because you can get information about asymptotic behavior of the solutions, the zeros of the solutions, and a host of other information can be gleaned from integral representations. This is the main advantage of the uh, use of Fourier transforms. You can use Fourier transforms to solve the heat equation. We got an integral representation. We saw, used it to solve the wave equation. We got integral representations. Integral representations are the are the most useful things in the study of differential equations. So with this I will conclude the three lectures on Fourier transforms and I have left out the small section on equipartitioning of energy for the wave equation. You need the Parseval formula for, for dealing with that and I have developed it in as a list of four or five exercises. Now <clears throat> you want to get a guided tour to this you can look at Strichart's book on Guide to Distribution Theory and Fourier Transforms. I would recommend that after you have listened to these three lectures, you should look up this book of Robert Strichart's. <clears throat> it is the best book uh, uh, on elementary theory of distributions and Fourier transforms. We are not touched upon distribution theory. We talked about the Schwarz piece of rapidly decreasing functions. Now, one can 
two that one can actually take the dual space of the Schwann space of rapidly decreasing function and you can get what are called as tempered distributions and you can take the Fourier transform of tempered distributions and, uh, and a very nice and very readable account of it is this book of Robert Richards. There you will find number of further information about the Hermite functions, about the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and, the, and the, uh, how the Gaussian and the significance of the Gaussian and a host of other things. It in, even has a section on wavelets uh, and, and such. So I think you can profitably read this book of Robert Stichards to study Fourier transforms. The theory of Fourier transform has a vast literature and we can't really get into all the subtle nuances of the theory of Fourier transforms and so we, I'll just leave it I'll, I'll just leave it here and these slides are available on my website I told you in the very first lecture where to find these uh, slides and this is and the, uh, and this course contains all the things that you will need for, a, for a, an engineering program and usually the material covered in this slides is not easily uh, available in standard texts. It is the result of many years of teaching and stuff and such. And um, we talked about a lot of things in this, in this. Of course, I can't cover it all in just three lectures. And I hope that the study of these notes and these uh, slides will, will be a refreshing and very enriching experience. Thank you very much.